We are empowered by lay-driven leadership, connecting lay ministries and business people to share Christ in the marketplace in support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to ASI. Welcome to Orlando, Florida. 3 Avian is so happy to be able to bring you ASI and what an incredible week we've had here in Orlando, Florida. Inspiring testimonies, amazing members in action where ASI, in spite of COVID and all the challenges that are going on in the world, are still evangelizing with power from the Holy Spirit. And what an incredible Sabbath school we just had here this morning. It was. I hope you did not That's miss it. Amazing. We heard from Dr. T.J. Knudsen and his wife, Marianne, and their three children. What an amazing story. The Sabbath school lesson is on Christ in the crucible. And this is a real life experience, how they have walked through mm. the valley of the shadow of death and how God is bringing them through. What an incredible testimony. If you missed it, you can always go to 3 ABM plus.tv later and we will have that available for you to watch but right now is the divine worship service and we're just getting ready for that amen asi is such an inspiration like you mentioned sabbath school i was so inspired you know at times we think we can be going through something in our life that's a challenge but there's always somebody else that's going through something even worse so let's pray for them continue to pray for them let's pray for our brothers and sisters again thank you for being a part of the three avian family and the asi family has been an incredible partnership through the years many many years, 3ABN, ASI have been working together for evangelism, spreading the love of Jesus around the world. What do we have to expect in the Divine Worship Hour this morning? Well, Divine Worship Hour, we have music, we have testimonies, we have the ASI offering, but we have the worship service itself with a sermon. Uh, D. Casper is the core evangelism training director, and he will be bringing us an incredible message. He's an anointed young man yes, of is. God. We're Amen. looking forward to his message. You know, and you mentioned just briefly about the offering. You will have an opportunity here in a few moments to actually, if you feel impressed, to give whatever the Holy Spirit is impressing you to give and support these ministries through ASI. That contact information will be up in just a couple of minutes, so you can be prepared to do that in just a few minutes. Behind us, you can hear the song service going on here at ASI Divine Worship Hour. Let's join that now. Happy Sabbath ASI family. It's a great privilege to be here once again to worship the Lord and to be together. And I want to welcome each and everyone being present here and those that are watching us on 3ABN or another uh, way of watching. Uh, I will ask that uh, you will stand to me to, together so we could uh, pray and ask the God, God's blessing. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you so abundantly gave us. Thank you for this opportunity and to be together, to worship you, to listen to the message that you prepared for us. And I pray that every single message that is going to be presented to be clearly understood to our hearts, to our minds, and to share with others and to let each and every one know about and soon return. I pray this in Jesus' name, and I thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath and good morning, ASI. It is my high privilege this morning to bring with me the elected General Conference officials. They're all here with us at ASI. And so this is a very high Sabbath. I want to first of all just introduce them, and then they'll say a few words to uh, to you. So, of course, you know very well Elder Ted Wilson, 
who was just re-elected to a third term, and I could not be happier, Elder Wilson. So welcome to ASI. Then we have Pastor Erton Curler. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm trying to listen to the way you say his name, to your name, who is the Executive Secretary of the Geron Conference. And then we have Brother Paul Douglas, who is the treasurer of the Geron Conference session. Of course, you know Denzel. He's one of the ASI um, team, President of Missions, Inc. But I want to hear a few words from them, more from Elder Wilson, just because of time constraints. And so, Elder Kohler, you're first. Um, you've been to ASI now twice. What do you think of ASI? Well, when I think about ASI, I have just one word that can summarize all my expectations and my feelings about this family. And the word is commitment. I appreciate, I like to see the, your commitment to the Lord, to the message, to the church, but especially to the mission of the church. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Brother Douglas, similar question to you. This is your second time at ASI. Yes, what it is my second time, and I'm delighted to be here. And I continue to be impressed by the passion for ministry that exists at ASI, and also the diversity of methods in how to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ for his soon coming kingdom. But the energy that I see in this room, the energy in the hallways, my hope and prayer is that it doesn't stay at the convention, but goes to the local congregation. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I've got a more difficult question for Elder Wilson, but I think he's up to it. Elder Wilson, in 1903, Ellen White had a vision, a vision that looked back at the 1901 General Conference session, a vision that's called what might have been. With these realities in our history and the condition we see in our church, how do you see us avoiding repeating history? Well, what might have been is yet to come by the Holy Spirit. The opportunity of seeing what God wants to do with his church in the final days of Earth's history is not necessarily in my hands or in your hands, but it is in God's hands working through us. And um, we've been calling for revival and reformation, humility, repentance. Our only hope is in Christ and his righteousness, in his power to save and to change lives. And we are to lift up Jesus in all our work and activities. I have been thrilled as I listened yesterday morning to the special presentation at 9 o'clock, the presentation last night, and this latest presentation by the Knutsons. I want to tell you, God's Spirit will work through all of us as we submit completely to Him. As we come to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, very familiar to all of us, we're told that if we humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways, then heaven will hear and forgive and heal our land. We're also told in first book of Selected Messages, 121, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. I'm thrilled with ASI's commitment to mission and to personal spiritual development, prayer, Bible study, the lifting up of Christ, and an understanding that the spirit of prophecy is one of God's greatest gifts to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're to allow Christ to align us with all of our 28 fundamental beliefs with Jesus being the center of every single one of those doctrines. You know, Scripture is replete with wonderful explanations of how we are to allow God to work through us in these very last days of Earth's history. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that 
Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. This is in volume seven of the Testimonies, 138. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them to be given to the world, not to be kept. And so we as Seventh-day Adventists are unique in that God has called Seventh-day Adventists to fulfill Revelation 12, 17, which I call the caller ID of Seventh-day Adventists that which helps us to fully understand that God is calling each of us in a very peculiar way to lift up his word and to be those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Seventh-day Adventists, that name tells us our origin and our future. It helps us to know who we are, to identify that we are part of God's last day remnant church. And so as we attempt, Andy, to bring God's people to the foot of the cross and to help them understand that we truly have a message, a unique message, we're reminded in ninth volume of Testimonies, page 19, that in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. It goes on to say, this is our solemn work, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. And so as we submit ourselves in complete humility to the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit, as we lift up Christ in all that we do and we are part of total member involvement saying, yes, Lord, I will go. I will be part of it. I'll be part of Christ's ministry physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. I will be lifting up Christ and his sanctuary service, pointing to what Christ has done for us, what he is doing for us in the most holy place, and what he will do for us. As we know, as scripture tells us, and as spirit of prophecy tells us, the work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. So as we work together through God's blessing, through his guidance to lift up his word, to lift up Christ in all that we do, what might have been will happen through God's precious power. Jesus is coming soon. I believe it with all my heart and I hope every one of you do too. Together, let us lean completely on Jesus. Maranatha. Thank you, Elder Wilson, for that wonderful challenge. You know, you gave my favorite quotation, where the work can't be finished until we work together. And as our ASI officers and uh, team come together here, we want to have a special prayer of dedication to uh, give to give dedication that we want to work together because we want to finish this work. So, uh, Andy, would you please lead us in a word of prayer as we dedicate ourselves and our these church special men to lead us as we go forward to finish this work and go home very soon. Amen. Thank you. Please bow your heads. Kind Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you first of all that it's the Sabbath day, a day that you have set aside to fellowship with us, to reveal to us even deeper truths of your word. I want to thank you for the election of these men to lead our church, and I want to ask a special blessing on Elder Wilson. Many of us have observed him over the last several years and have been very appreciative 
and thankful for his leadership. I want to lift him up and pray that you will keep him focused on you. He has an agenda that is one that will bring in the second coming. Because only as we focus on you, focus on the cross, and in humility participate in confession and repentance and earnest prayer, only then will you have a people that you can work with. So I pray a special blessing for Elder Wilson that he'll have a baptism of your Holy Spirit each and every day. I pray for those that will be holding up his hands, his special assistant, Magdil, and assistant also, my dear friend, Mark Finley. I pray that they will hold his hands up like Caleb and Joshua. I also pray for Pastor Kuller and for Pastor Douglas that as they carry out their duties, they will know that that is also ministry. I pray for the ASI team as well, Amen. that, Lord, we will have a view of the kingdom. Right now we know, because we're told in Scripture that you stand up, and we know that you're standing up right now, looking down on this convention. I pray that our theme revived to witness, will have taken heart in our souls, preceded by hard work of repentance and confession. I pray for us as we leave this place today and continue in this Sabbath that we will not lose what we've gained here in what we called initially when we came on Wednesday, the upper room. So I pray a special blessing on this service today and on these men. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, amen. 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 I invite you to stand with me as we sing our opening hymn, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart.
my students enjoy watching things grow from a seed all the way to produce. Gardening also empowers the children to grow things from the seed so that they can also provide food for their friends and their family. I am very excited about the Acquainting Agricultural Program. This allows us to teach the children agriculture during the months of the year when gardening is not at its peak. By having an outdoor hoop house or a caterpillar tunnel, we also have an outdoor learning spot where we can be teaching during the winter months when school is in session. And it also helps teachers like me, who are not very acquainted with agriculture, I get a platform, a curriculum in which we can use to teach the children and learn ourselves agriculture and how to garden. That also gives the children the information that they need to go home and to, to have a, a gardening program with their families at home. It's cool to like watch the plant grow because it's like us. We're small, but then we grow, grow, grow. It was fun to watch the children in the building of the tunnel. The steps were very simple, easy to understand, and the children were able to help a great portion of what was done. It was very good to see the children cooperating and building the tunnel themselves. They feel now ownership of that tunnel and this program. When I come out and work in the garden, it makes me happy. It's like Jesus is right here next to me and I'm working with him. Amen. So there are four projects that we would just like to bring before you as we enter into our offering period. And uh, at this time, I'd like to talk with uh, Angela Fraunfelder. Uh, <laughs> and that's a mouthful, Fraunfelder. Yeah, you can thank my husband. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So um, I learned a lot from that video because I'm not a gardener by nature. Can you share with me a little bit more about this project? Yeah, so Acquainting Agriculture is an initiative of the Adventist Agricultural Association. If you want to be part of an incredible community, we meet in January. We have a conference every year to network and to mentor and to encourage each other to be a ministry to others while living in the country. And this is an agricultural curriculum for our schools and our home schools. So it's designed to be taught during the academic school year we're growing during the school year which means we're winter growing and you can see the ideal is if our students can have a hoop house now we understand that all of our schools have room for a hoop house so therefore we teach how to do grow light stations right there in the classroom or raise beds different things like that and then really the idea is that it's not just a school garden the idea is that the springtime they're starting to teach their parents what they want to do that summer and at the end of the school year each student goes home with a tray of seedlings and they grow with their family families in the summer. Well, that's really exciting. So it's a, a special curriculum using agriculture to teach them about the love of Jesus kind of through gardening. Absolutely. Right. So there's three levels. Planting with Jesus is grades one through four. Five through eight is God in the garden. And our high school version is grow to know him. And each lesson has a spiritual component. So the main point is to fall in love with Jesus through his creation. Tell me a little bit more about the church edition. Yes. So we are working on something very special. It's going to be called grow to share him. And and the idea is you can run a community outreach at your church to teach other people how to garden. And so therefore there'll be a spiritual component, there'll be a health component, but we're taking the high school version and we're condensing it to eight to 10 weeks where you could teach your community how to grow their own food. So not only are you feeding them spiritually, but your church will be a light on the hill and you'll feed them physically as well. And you're even partnering with another ASI member, Farm Stew. Yes, yes, we're very excited. So Farm Stew has a chapter in our high school version. They also are a big component of our 7th and 8th grade curriculum. So if our little child has been going through acquainting agriculture for years, by their 7th and 8th grade, they might be a little bored of it. So you have to add something different. So what we've done is we partnered with Farm Stew and we have real life agricultural mission stories. So we can show them that they could use agriculture to reach people for Jesus. And at the beginning of their journal in the 7th and 8th grade year, they choose where they'd like to work for Jesus, where they'd like to be a Farm Stew planter. That could be in a food desert in America, that could be in the Philippines, it could be in Sub-Sahara Africa. They get to choose and as they learn about their agriculture zone, they learn about that agriculture zone. When they think of and they study about their pest and diseases, they study about that area's plant diseases and pest. 
Now, I'm really excited that this particular project also does something to energize educators. Tell us about the one-room classroom in New York. Yeah, so one of our dear teachers, she was a one-room school teacher who had no idea how to garden, and she was kind of terrified. And this is what's really awesome. The church got behind her, and they formed a garden curriculum committee, and they helped her start the garden program. And so it's just a small one-room school. And at the end of this last school year, she emailed me, and she said, I, I've never felt this way, but I feel bittersweet about the school year ending. Now I'm a teacher. Let me tell you, we're not usually bittersweet at the end of the school year. We're usually counting down the days just as much as the kids, shh, maybe that should be a secret, but we really are excited for this summer. But gardening, they have actually found in secular studies that gardening has brought a renewed passion to public school teachers when they have a garden at their school. Well, how much more in our schools with the love of Jesus in our gardens will it renew um, us as teachers to continue to love what we're doing? And it's very evident that God is in this and is leading. Tell us about the Montana experience. Yeah, so we had one conference. People are always asking, well, our school's doing it. Please understand we've just started selling the curriculum this year. And so just this academic school year, uh, we'll have schools all across the U.S. of A doing it. And we had one conference who took the bull by the horns and said, we are going to support our 12 schools. And they talked to the Board of Ed, the superintendent, at the Montana conference. Now, if you can grow in Montana, in the academic school year, you can grow anywhere, right? And so they talked to the Board of Ed and they gave the money to each one of their schools to have the tools they need to do the garden curriculum. So we're very excited because there are schools um, every day emailing us and requesting the curriculum and we're really excited to see our kids back outside. I'm really excited about this project, and I know all the schools are. Angela is very passionate. She has been all over the nation just <laughs> promoting this and letting them know your children can learn so much about Jesus and through the, the whole experience of gardening. Thank you so much, Angela, for what you're doing through Acquainting Agriculture, and we're praying that our offering will be in abundance so that you will be able to continue forward. Thank you. Thank you. Coming to the podium now are Debbie and Doug Baker. Debbie is the uh, president of Heritage Academy, and Doug is the principal of Heritage Academy. Now, little known fact, Angela, who just left the podium, she used to teach at Heritage Academy, and actually the seeds were planted at Heritage Academy for that particular project. That's where it all began. So truly, we are kind of working hand in glove. So um, with Heritage Academy, we're talking about a project that's going to provide funding so that we can improve the evangelistic outreach with the students. Tell us, though, how it began. How is it that the idea of students doing evangelism emerged? Well, we were going to do an evangelistic series, and we were planning to go down to Chattanooga. And we found that there wasn't anybody that could partner with us there because all the churches were closed because of COVID. And so we um, talked to our friends that it is written. And so they partnered with us. They had just done an online evangelistic series. And so they sent um, Doug, Naha, Doug Naha, who's one of their trainers, to our campus and he worked with our kids for six weeks and um, trained them and then they wrote the whole series themselves under his uh, guidance. Okay, so tell us, Debbie, a little bit more about this. Give us some details about the features and you said they wrote the whole program and was this online then? And Right. So, you know, we have students that are in video production, and so they love graphics and creating those things and colors, and so they created the theme, the graphics, the intros, the exits. The students got together and they did the special music and planned those for every night. So each night there was an intro, there was a student that gave an introduction, there was a special music, there was a speaker, and then at the end there was a panel discussion, and the students wrote the the sermon the students wrote the questions for the panel discussion and so it really you know they took ownership it, they were really excited and learned an awful lot were convicted now we know we have a video so that we want to be able to play that so that you get a little bit of a taste of what that program looked like we won't it won't be a 30 minute pro visit video but we want to give you a flavor of what um, everyone experienced Are you? I'm a 
on the edge of fall apart But somehow your promises find my troubled heart This is the truth I'm standing on Even when all my strength is gone You are faithful forever Brothers and sisters, if you're tired of, of the lie that Satan gives you and you're willing and you're ready to say, Jesus, I want to say yes and I want to choose more, I ask you stand wherever you are. Be it your living room, be it in the kitchen, wherever you are, stand right now because you're saying, Jesus, look, right now, I want to what? Commit my life to you. God is telling us, be aware of this. I'm warning you that Satan is out like a roaring lion to destroy you and, and open your eyes. Come out of this spiritual apathy that you're in. You know, come out of this Babylon that you're in. You know, stop playing around with sin because it is dangerous. And, yeah. and you know, I'm coming soon. God knows the plans he has for me. He knows the thoughts he thinks towards me. God knows the plans He has for me. He knows the thoughts He thinks towards me. And the thing is an accident. I'm alive because there's more. Sing, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. In Incredible. Now, Doug, I want to ask you, because it was very apparent to me, that young man, I thought he was a seasoned, fervent speaker. Um, tell us, how did this whole thing uh, affect the students? Well, just to follow up, the young man you saw is Cameron Sanders, Jr., and um, he's, he's gone on from us. He graduated this past year, and this summer he's been with Maranatha's Ultimate Workout, and he has been the chaplain for that. And last week, um, they culminated with the baptism, and he baptized he baptized a number of um, students who were there. Wow! So we have a picture of that of that young speaker that is actually involved in the baptism. Wow! That's in, that's really exciting. Um, tell us, Debbie, where where are we going with the project for this? With this? Well, we're really excited um, to be able to have the help of ASI. Um, to pull together a few more resources to, to really help young people write and deliver this kind of evangelistic series. Um, we're just, we're tickled. Um, you know, they think they're helping others when it's kind of sneaky. By the end, you know, they're the ones that have really been touched and their lives have been changed. So, you know, for, as educators for us, there's nothing finer. So. And so this is something that just has, a, it, not, it was not just another assignment. Um, a few of the students were involved, and at the culmination of this, more students wanted to be involved. Yeah, after the, you know, in the beginning, they weren't quite sure, right? So we had a few that signed up, and they did this during their vocational time. But when the others saw the product, they were like, I want to get involved. Mm -hmm. So now we have a huge list of students that want to be a part. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much for what you're doing at Heritage Academy and involving students in the most important work that we can give them, to reach out and tell others about Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And Debbie and Doug Baker are, are actually going to be assuming responsibility for overseeing our Youth for Jesus program. So it is in good hands. We're really excited about that. Now coming to the podium, we have Dan Houghton from Heart Research at Merlin, uh, excuse me, Merlin Burt, Merlin Burt, <laughs> who's the director at the E.G. White Estate, and Daryl Thompson, the associate director. And Dan, I know that we've been talking a lot all, all since the beginning of the convention about E.G. White books and the ASI books, but how are we going to get those books 
out beyond the written page. Well, I'm going to do that. First, I want to ask a question. How many of you got a set of these while you've been here at the convention? Let me see your hands. All right, there should be about 500, actually 499 because I'm holding one. <laughs> but uh, we're very excited about this. But I want you to know if you turn into the first page of any one of these books, you're going to find a QR code there. And Debbie, that's how we're going to transition to be able to get them out way more than just the printed copy, even though printed copies are very important, that QR code opens us up to a complete new digital world, which is where we are having the greatest impact with all of our, um, with all of our uh, getting LNG White books out wherever they're going to go. Now, uh, Daryl, I want to ask you a question first. It was about 13 years ago Correct. that we actually began a partnership between ASI and the LNG White Estate. Now, tell us what's happened in that partnership from your perspective. Well, I just was talking to you this morning about that, Dan. And I can remember in 2009 when you came to the White Estate to visit us. And back then, we just had English. That was the only thing that we had available online. Some of you remember maybe the old Palm and the, the Windows C yes. apps and the CD-ROM. And we had about online, we did have a website. But we only had 35,000 visitors a week that came, a month that came to the website. Now, I was looking up the results of what we've had so far this year. And so far this year, we've had 59.74 million visitors that have come to the EGW Writings website and apps so far this year in the last seven months. See the difference that a partnership can wow. make with ASI? It, it does. Now, how does that break out per month? How many, we had 35,000 now, if that 50, 58, 59,000, I think you said, yeah. 59 million? 59 million. Okay, so how many million is that per month? A it's a little over 8 million per okay. month. So it's a eight, little over 2 million a week. Okay, 2 million people a week, 2 million visitors are going and looking up Ellen White books online because of this partnership. Now, they have to be looking at something. Um, so how many, how many languages and books and those kind of things have actually, because they were in English in 2009, now in 2022, what do we have? Okay, so partnerships are fantastic things. And ASI has been very faithful over the last 13 years in partnering with us. And everyone that is here that has contributed, you are the ones that have made a difference to this ministry. We have 450 new translations and books available online because of ASI. Mm, you have been the difference. Amen. Now, I want to make sure we understand that's 450 in, translated into various languages. 137 languages. Okay, so 450 titles 137 languages are out there for anybody anywhere in the world that is close to an internet connection yes. is able to see the LNG White materials. Now, I'm going to draw, st step over. I'm going to come back in just a minute. But Brother Bert, tell us, what do you think Ellen White would be thinking if she could see what was happening right now with the EG White Estate and the digitization of all these books? I don't, I don't think she could have even imagined it. But I think she, if she, once she understood, she would be praising God. You know, we have lots of times where she says, I can praise God. I think this would, have been the, this would be one of the things that she would say, praise God. You know, I think of a, a statement that she made or something she wrote towards the end of her life. She was reflecting on what her work would be uh, in the future. Of course, she would go to sleep in Jesus maybe, but how would her ministry impact and how would God's work continue? And she would write, um, whether or not my life is spared, my writings will constantly speak and their work will go forward as long as time shall last. And I, I can I just tell a little story, just very, very brief, I have very 30 seconds. It was on March 3. 1915, after she'd had her accident, her hip had been broken, she was in bed, but God gave her her last vision. And W.C. White sat by her bed and took down the words as she very clearly shared, first about the importance of youth connecting to the truth, and then second, that God showed her that her writings should be made available for those, as she said, in foreign lands 
So her last message from God was about this very thing that you are partnering with the white estate on and with the church and with the Lord's work to let something very powerful happen Amen. in these last days. So I want to ask all of you to think for a moment, what does it feel like to be a part of the fulfillment of prophecy? That's what's happening right in front of our eyes. Now, several things quickly that I want to go to. We are, last year, we talked about languages for, the, for India. Yes. Now, and before that time, just give us a quick, Daryl, uh, what has happened with that and what kind of numbers are we seeing now sure. in India? So last year, uh, we asked for some help from ASI and $50,000 was given to the white estate. We took that and we've brought on 16 new languages and 16 more books in Indian dialects. Now, before then, we used to have just a, a few thousand, one or two thousand that used to come in. We are now averaging 60,000 visitors a month coming in from India as a result of the money that you gave us last year. Okay. Praise God. So you can see that it goes directly from whenever we put the money in, these folks go to work and have their teams going, and it goes out and has its impact. You just heard it with your own ears. Now, this coming year, we have in the offering $100,000 for this year. This is one of our major offering points. And what are we going to do this year? Okay, so we're going to add more languages this year. And we've got a new focus, of course, and that is we want to do 26 more languages in Indian dialects on three key books, Great Controversy, Steps to Christ, and Desire of Ages. It'll be a multi-year project, but that's what the money will be going towards. Merlin, how many languages do we have the Great Controversy in digitized now? It's more than 100. Okay, and we're gonna see that keep increasing, especially during these years, as we're coming up towards 23 and 24, as we're emphasizing the Great Controversy. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment an Indian family in the nation of India somewhere. And we know that about 60% of all of the internet action takes place on a PC that's on a desktop. So I'm going to start with that idea. And that Indian man that's the head of his household finds the LNG White website and he discovers there's books in his language. He shares with his wife and maybe his brother-in-law and his son, and, and they all share out, and maybe it's on, it's on phones now, and it's on other devices, and it's spreading virally as people hear about that. That's what your offering is about this year. And we are very grateful. And Debbie, I'm just thinking, you know, we always have an offering goal. And you know what? You have all been incredibly faithful, and I want to say thank you for your financial faithfulness to, to making your gifts to God through our offering. But we also have an overflow, and I just want to comment that this project is in the overflow for one-third. They get one-third of the overflow. And I want you to know that no matter how large that overflow is, they will be able to do as many languages as we can fund and it will spread like wildfire all over the world. God bless you, and I hope you'll be generous this morning. Thank you very much, Dan. You know, it's exciting to know that actually um, all that has happened in the Ukraine, at the time that the war began, they, the E.G. White estate experienced a significant increase of hits uh, looking for resources um, and looking for specifically last day events because of what was going on. And speaking of Ukraine, I have Steve Dickman here with me. He's the president of Outpost Centers International. And Steve, you were not long ago in Ukraine. Tell us what you saw there. By God's grace, uh, when the conflict began starting on February 24, we began reaching out to some of our ministries there to see what their situation was because we have OCI ministries in Ukraine, we have OCI ministries in Russia, we have OCI, OCI ministries in adjoining countries like Romania and Moldova and Poland. And it became evident to us that the situation was critical and needed to be addressed. So we began to look at how we might help. 
and we began to publish some weekly reports. Maybe some of you have seen some of those Ukraine reports where we're just trying to keep the awareness of the situation there in Ukraine and the impact that it's having. Millions of people have had to flee from their homes, never knowing if they would get to go back. You heard some of the testimonies and stories in Sabbath school this morning, Denzel was sharing about people living in their basements. And the initial phase of this crisis was significant. Many of our institutions immediately became refugee centers and places where people could stay and sleeping on the floors and just uh, accommodating as many as possible. And so the situation there has trying to transition from that now because time has elapsed, the conflict continues, and the needs even continue to grow. Now, speaking of those needs, what kind of initiative now is in place to try and meet some of those needs? So as we have seen what's happening on the ground and worked with our local ministries and other partners that are working there in Ukraine, we noticed that there was a demand or a need for people for medical services, dental services, psychological counseling, and all of these things and it was not in just one place. There was not just some place you could go and here are all the refugees or displaced people from Ukraine and you could find them all in one place. They were scattered all over. And so we began to partner. And I think we have a few pictures. They can just start rolling those. We began to partner with Angelica Clinic and other entities there that were providing mobile services. And so... We began to purchase some vehicles and outfit those so that we could move from place to place very quickly, from one village to another. And very closely with that, it's interesting that they understood immediately that this should be connected to the local Seventh-day Adventist church. And so as these vehicles were outfitted, they began, uh, first of all, they had just a general practice uh, van. They'd drive around and provide some services, but they said, that's not all we need. And so they outfitted a, a dental van, and they outfitted a women's health van, and they outfitted an imaging van, and they outfitted a prescription van. And so now, when they come into one of these local communities, they have a full palette of services available. And as these displaced people, that many of them are living in very substandard situations, schools that have been converted to refugee housing, and even... I was there visiting one of our Adventist schools and they took me through. And instead of classrooms full of students and desks, they had classrooms where they had put in bunk beds and they had put in little, every little corner was full of someone who was there in, uh, in a refugee status. So it's amazing uh, the needs and how scattered they are. Now, uh, I really appreciate and glad that we have mobile vans that are going to them. But I would imagine, though, with the kind of needs that you're serving, that that may not be able to be completely accomplished in one encounter. What happens if they have long-term needs? So here's what's happening. The mobile clinics have a system that they're evaluating every person that comes through. And they're connecting them with the local church, and they're connecting them with future services as needed in that location. But if their needs go beyond that, we're partnering with our lifestyle centers that have become refugee centers, and now we're transitioning those to rehabilitation centers. So they're able to go there and get some intensive counseling, some intensive lifestyle tune-ups, so that they can face life as it now exists in their situation. So tell me, what is the expense for all of this? This sounds like thousands of dollars. Well, if you add it all up, it is thousands of dollars for sure. But individually, the average person that comes to one of the mobile clinics gets generally, um, on average, three services. If it's a woman with some kind of challenges with her uh, women's health issues, she sees maybe a provider in the women's health van, and then she might go and get a dental appointment and maybe a counseling session. And so all of that rolled up together, including whatever medications are necessary, is only averaging about $35 a day or per person for each person served. And sometimes they'll serve 50, sometimes 100, depending on the day, depending on the location. But all of those people are being, again, intimately tied to the local church. Already people are being baptized because they see the compassion 
and the love of people reaching out to them and helping them. So if they're getting extended services or long-term services, is that an additional expense? So that also, interestingly enough, can be done for about $35 a day per individual served and how many days they were there. If they need to stay three days, five days, seven days, whatever it is that is, uh, is their need, it's still about $35 a day. So it makes it a nice multiple. For $350, Debbie, you can serve 10 people. 10 people. But we praise God. We have William, though, who is in the Ukraine just this last week. We just talked to him yesterday. We had to record it because we couldn't figure out how to do it live. But I want to roll William's video and his experience there. Right. Yeah, it was a great experience. We spent about a week there. Um, the team on the ground with Angeli Clinic, Dr. Serhi, did an excellent job coordinating with all the churches along the way where we did the clinics we saw over 300 patients and delivered over a thousand individual medical encounters or services um, with the team we had a neurologist an ER doctor doing EKGs and a couple family medicine physicians to take care of problems we had a mobile pharmacy with us and it was just a tremendous blessing to be able to spend time with these people who many of whom especially the men are stuck in the country they can't leave many people displaced. One lady in particular, I recall her sharing her story of how her son was hit with a missile as two aircraft were fighting above her in the sky. Um, five of them were in this checkpoint and were killed. And she was in the midst of grief and question, questioning whether God, whether he would be in heaven. And I, I really just encouraged her that God is a good God and desires as many as possible to be saved and he is our advocate in the judgment and she left with what she said as a sense of a weight had come up lifted off of her and the perspective that i gained was invaluable we have so much to be grateful for and so much to give and your gifts in this regard go so far in the country there are many needs from medications to more medical equipment to sustaining these clinics that they're putting on and helping so many people who are going through a terrible experience. And we know that in this world, we will have tribulation, but God has overcome the world and we want to be part of his work. So I invite you to participate in that. Wow, amen. Thank you so much for sharing that, Steve. William, William Guthrie, he's the son of... He's an ASI <laughs> child, <laughs> right? right? Patty Guthrie's son. That's right. He's a doctor, even though he looks like a teenager. <laughs> He's a doctor, and he's there serving the needs of these people right on the front lines in Ukraine. Wow, praise God. Thank you so much, Steve, Thank for you, sharing Dave. that story. So you see, we have a lot of work before us, but I mentioned last night, we have been so blessed. We need to build a longer table, not taller fences. So, you know, think about the children who can learn about the Creator through gardening. Think about the youth whose their own lives are changed as they use their skills to develop evangelism online. Think about the number of uh, books, Ellen White books, that can be digitized in already translated languages, $1,500 to digitize one title. Think about the number of Ukrainian refugees who can be served and their needs met for just $35. So 10 people, $350. 100 people, $3,500. And it goes on. So much can be done for us giving really, comparatively speaking, so little. At this time, I want you to think about um, and pray and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Through our sacrificial gifts, we can make such a significant difference, not just for these four, not for just the few that we heard about throughout the week, but for the 29 projects that are listed in the booklet. Remember that we have an overflow that, as Dan so eloquently said, can go so far beyond for One Day Church, for the Ellen G. White Project, and and also for the Ukraine, the Ukraine Medical um, Mobile Clinic. There's so much that can be done that we want to really stretch so that God can do his work. So at this time, we're going to um, prepare to lift the offering. And if the deacons can take their places, you should have an envelope. 
And if you need one, please raise your hand so that we can provide that to you. I see some hands here in the front. The other thing is that if you have your mobile device, you can give online. So for those of you watching at home and you want to say, I want to be a part of this, you can. Just go to asiministries.org, and in the menu drop down, there's a donate button. You can complete all of the information there for pledges and gifts, and we we would be happy to receive those and turn those into these projects so that they could reach the world for Jesus. So remember, asiministries.org. Those of you who have devices that are here in the auditorium, you can give that way as well. So we want to um, give you that opportunity to share what God has given you. And just before we lift the offering, let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you would give us the faith and the courage to give sacrificially and to share of the blessings so that we can build a longer table. Lord, we long to be in heaven where at that welcome table, we will be able to see miles and miles and miles and know that someone may come up to us and say, because you gave, I am here. We ask that the Holy Spirit would multiply our gifts so that many more souls will be saved. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, ASI family. It's good to be here, and I hope you're glad to be here, too. And I'm going to have the scripture reading right now, so if you would turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53, and we're going to be reading verse 11. I'm reading from the New King James Version. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Would you bow your heads with me for prayer? 
Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful to be here, and we're just so grateful for your love for us, and we need you so much, Lord. Thank you for the things that you do in our lives to show us how much we need you. And we're just so grateful that we can come before you in the name and in the person of your Son, that you've opened up a way, Lord, to come right into your throne room. And I'm so thankful that Jesus is standing before you right now. We have a request, Lord. We pray that you would give us a great measure of your Holy Spirit in this meeting. We need your words to come into our hearts, to change us, to open up our eyes, to wake us up. And we believe that Jesus right now is taking our words, our imperfect words, rising up from every heart, and that he's presenting them before you, Father, as his very own request. And so we're really thankful that you've promised that you will always hear the Son. So we know that you will answer our prayer, and we just want to thank you in advance for the way that you will lift us up right into your throne room and bring us the blessing that we so desperately need. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, sometimes you have the privilege of introducing someone that you just met behind the stage a few minutes ago or someone that you knew as an acquaintance, but today I have the blessing of introducing a good friend, uh, D. Casper. D. Casper is someone that I consider a, quote, brand plucked from the fire. Now, all of us are true of that in some degree, but I think especially D.'s uh, testimony is incredible. He grew up in southern Illinois in sort of a non-attending, nominal Christian family, and without realizing that he was just a few miles down the road from 3AB, 3ABN, began watching 3ABN, not knowing that they were just uh, around the corner from him. But in watching those programs, um, he became convinced about the Adventist message and found out about a program called Arise, a discipleship training program from Light Bears Ministry. He attended that in 2010 and was baptized as Seventh-day Adventist in 2010 through that discipleship training program. Since then, uh, Dee has been on what I would call an exponential spiritual growth curve. Um, he went from there to being a Bible worker, to being a Bible teacher. He travels regularly to academies and universities and colleges and weeks of prayer. Just a real blessing. Has a huge burden for communicating the assurance of salvation and the gospel um, to all of the young people in our church. He's currently the director of Core Evangelism Training Program, which is a ministry of the Pennsylvania Conference. A wonderful training program. Um, they're booth 422 if you'd like to visit them. Um, they do literature evangelism, health evangelism, agriculture, gospel studies. It's a wonderful nine-month uh, gospel training program that D. Casper is the director of. Today, Dee's going to be sharing with us, after a wonderful special music from Fletcher Academy, um, Jesus' faith, key to our revival.
Morning, ASI. Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you, Fletcher Academy. Such a gift. Good to see you all again. It's a privilege to be with you all today. Uh, this morning, I've been asked to address the topic that I believe is of incredible importance to us as a people, especially if we want to experience revival in our personal lives and corporately as a movement. And we're going to be discussing the faith of Jesus. It's a story that many of us may view as familiar, but my prayer is that God allows us to experience this in a fresh and new way and in a way that will radically transform our lives. Uh, Bob mentioned yesterday that it's possible to be serving Jesus while being in a state of having lost our first love for Him, that we can be so busy serving Him that we forget to love Him, uh, to be with Him, to bring Him with us. And, um, and it's possible to not be aware of that. And so, I believe what can guard us from that is the topic that we're addressing today. And so, I really believe God did something special, what Bob shared to morning, uh, yesterday morning in preparing us for today. So, today we're going to be addressing the simple story of the cross. I invite you to join me as we pray. I'm going to kneel, invite you to bow your heads. Sweet Jesus, I thank You for this privilege to look at you this morning, to see you in your highest moment, and we've been challenged in the counsel that we've been given as a church to be willing to be small men handling great subjects. Lord, I confess I'm a small man, but I know you have what's needed. So I pray that as I handle the greatest of subjects, that you would bless us, that you would show us your glory. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We're told in the 1888 materials that the want, the need, what's most desired in the religious experience is the acceptance of Jesus Christ as presented in the gospel. This is what we need the most. So what is that gospel? Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, which implies some things. It first implies that he saw value in the thing that he's seeking. You don't go looking for something that you don't value. And it also implies that he's taking the initiative in bringing about the solution, even though we are in a horrible condition, that Jesus is taking the initiative. And I'm so thankful for this, that God was not waiting for us to do something before he did something. He takes the divine initiative going forward, even though we're in a horrible condition. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus did not just write a check for the price of sin. He literally became sin and received the wrath of God towards sin to set us free. But what did that look like? And what does that teach us about the faith of Jesus? I'd like to tell you the story this morning that has radically changed my life. It's the story of the closing hours of Jesus' life. In John chapter 13 to 17, this is a quote from Desire of Ages, uh, and she's commenting on John 13 to 17 and this kind of last discourse that Jesus has with the disciples. If you have a red letter Bible, it's a bunch of red letters, all the things that need to be said and shared with him before his departure. She says, during that time, Jesus had earnestly been conversing with his disciples and instructing them. But as he neared Gethsemane, he became strangely silent. He had often visited this spot for meditation and prayer, but never with a heart so full of sorrow as upon this night of his last agony. Throughout his life on earth, he had walked in the light of God's presence. When in conflict with men who were inspired by the very spirit of Satan, Jesus could say, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. I do always those things that please him. But now he seemed to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Now he was numbered with the transgressors. The guilt of fallen humanity he must bear, and upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him, so great is the weight of guilt which he must bear, that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his Father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. As they approached the garden, the disciples had marked the change that came over their master, and never had they seen him so utterly sad and silent. As he proceeded, this strange sadness deepened, yet they dared not question him as to the cause. They don't even have the courage to ask what's wrong, and his form swayed as if it were about to fall. As Jesus reaches the garden, the disciples look anxiously for his usual place of retirement and that their master might rest. But every step that Jesus now took was with labored effort. He groaned aloud. Jesus wails in this moment, as if suffering under the pressure of a terrible burden. Twice his companions supported him, or else he would have fallen to the earth. Imagine, Jesus' legs collapse from under him, and they have to catch him, else he would have fallen to the ground on two different occasions. He felt that by sin, he was being separated from his Father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. This agony he must not exert his divine power to escape. As man, he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. And as man, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. Christ was now standing in a different attitude from that in which he had ever stood before. As the substitute and surety for sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw what justice meant Hitherto he had been an intercessor for others, but now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. Imagine Jesus, whoever lives to intercede for you and me, and in this moment, I just wish someone would pray for me. 
It's difficult. The psychological agony that Jesus is going through in this moment is so intense that physiologically the man begins to bleed through his pores. The life forces are being crushed out of him. By the way, you know what the word Gethsemane means? It's the press. It's a place where they smash oil out of olives. And Jesus is literally having the life forces pressed out of him in this moment because of the weight of your sin and of mine. Now, you and I under these same circumstances, we can check out when things get too hot, right? We pick up the phone, we run away from conviction, we do something else, call somebody, change the channel, right? When something convicts us, Jesus doesn't have that opportunity. Jesus has to stare down the gun barrel of this circumstance, and there's nowhere for him to run. Back to Desire of Ages, what was to be gained by this sacrifice? How hopeless appeared the guilt and ingratitude of men, and in its hardest features, Satan pressed the situation upon the Redeemer. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you, Jesus. They're seeking to destroy you. One of your own disciples, who's also listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities, will betray you. One of your most zealous followers will deny you. All will forsake you. Christ's whole being abhorred the thought that those whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he loved so much, should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. The conflict was terrible. The sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ, and the sense of God's wrath against sin was literally crushing out his life. Guys, this is before a single hand has been laid upon him. No one has yanked out his beard. He hasn't been punched in the face. He's not been tortured or scourged, and he's already to the point of death because of the weight of your sin and mine. Behold him contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. And in his agony, Jesus clings to the cold ground as if to prevent himself from being drawn any farther from God. The human heart longs for sympathy in suffering. Is that true? Yeah. This longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being. In this moment, he's just longing for Peter, James, or John to crawl across that cold gravel, place a hand on his shoulder, and tell him, Jesus, we're here. They can't tell him it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. And what does Jesus get from them? Nothing. In the supreme agony of his soul, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those whom he so often had blessed and comforted and shielded in sorrow and distress. The one who had always had words of sympathy for them was now suffering superhuman agony, and he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. Were they? No. How dark seemed the malignity of sin. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of their own guilt while he stood innocent before God. Jesus is strongly tempted in this moment to leave us, guys. It's so overwhelming. His humanity is shrinking from this responsibility, we're told, in another place. But if he could only know that his disciples understood and appreciated how difficult this is for him, he could be strengthened. Did they? No. So was he strengthened? No. Jesus prays three prayers of agony, pleading with the Father to be delivered from this call. If it's possible, Father, please. And then your face comes into the mind of Jesus. And this is what gives him the intrinsic motivation to even utter the words, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And this back and forth is agonizing for Jesus. And the cup that he's talking about is the same cup mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. It's the cup of God's unmingled wrath. And Jesus is drinking that thing to the dregs right now. 
Second volume of the Testimonies tells us, in this moment, Jesus was realizing his father's frown. He had taken the cup of suffering from the lips of guilty man and proposed to drink it himself and in its place give to man the cup of blessing. The wrath that would have fallen upon man was now falling upon Christ and it was here that that mysterious cup trembles in Jesus' hand. It was the sins of a lost world that were upon him and overwhelming him, and again, a sense of his father's frown. The unmingled wrath of God is being poured out upon God. It's a seeming contradiction in terms, but you're on the mind of Jesus, and this is what leads him for a third time to say, nevertheless, if this is what it takes to win them, I will do it. And we're told this powerful, heartbreaking line in Desire of Ages, page 690, that in this moment, after that third submission, we're told that his decision is made and he will save man at any cost to himself. I don't know how, I don't care how much this hurts. I don't care how difficult this gets. This train will not stop. Whatever it takes to save them, whatever they deserve, lay that on me, he says. And boy, does he. But he's not the only one who's hurting in this moment. God suffered with his son, and there was silence in heaven. Heaven is not a place that's known for being silent. Read the book of Revelation. And could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic hosts, as in silent grief the angels watch the Father separating His beams of light, love, and glory from His beloved Son. They would better understand how offensive in His sight is sin. If we saw the strange act that they had to witness, we would not do what we do. And then God has to send an angel from the right hand of His throne to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to do for Him what we did not do, what Peter, James, and John did not do. It's this heartbreaking and touching scene in Desire of Ages where this angel comes down to earth, cradles the head of Jesus in His bosom, and speaks tender words of encouragement to Him, reminding Him of the promises of God. Jesus, you will see the travail of your soul and be satisfied. It's going to be worth it. That this is my son in whom I am well pleased, it's still true. And what's implied in these texts and what Jesus says earlier as he enters the garden is that he never would have even made it out of that garden were it not for this visitation from the angel. The biblical text says that the angel was sent to strengthen him. Ellen White alludes earlier that we read that he had the disciples shown him the appreciation of what he was going through, he could have been strengthened. They didn't. Jesus says, my soul's exceedingly sorrowful even to death. And it's this angelic visit, I believe, that even gives Jesus the ability to continue this journey. As he goes down to the, garden of, uh, to the gate, basically, for the garden, he's greeted by, greeted by this group of brute guards with implements they're not going to need for Jesus. He's a man of peace. And yet in this moment, he's greeted by Judas, who betrays him with a kiss. And in that moment, Jesus musters the unselfish love to refer to this man as friend. Friend. Some of us in this room this morning have people in our lives today that we cannot refer to as friend because they went too far. What they did was too much, and I just can't. In His strength, you can. Amen? Amen. We're not asking you to return to abusive scenarios or so forth. That's not the point. But what we are saying is the disposition of your heart towards these individuals can change by God's grace. Then Peter has a brilliant idea. He grabs a sword and gets busy and hacks Malchus's ear off. And the response of Jesus in this moment is a response that some of us may need to hear today. Put your sword in its place, Peter. I don't need your violence to defend me. Jesus doesn't need your violent arguments either. I can handle it. They aren't taking my life. 
I'm giving myself for them. The kingdom of heaven is not advanced by taking. It's the glory of God to give, we're told. Then Jesus is given a sham of a trial where the word justice isn't even invited to the conversation. Soon after this, Isaiah 52 alludes to the fact that he's literally beaten beyond the point of recognition. You cannot recognize who this man is when they're finished with him. And then he's brought before the Jews, and what do they have to say for the Messiah that's come to save them? We will not have this man as Lord over us. We have no king but Caesar, and give us Barabbas. And we think to ourselves, what savages, what monsters, how could they say such a thing? But before we're too hard on the Jews, we need to come face to face with the reality that every time you and I choose our choice sins over Jesus, we're saying the exact same thing. I will not have this man as Lord over me. I have no king but Caesar, and give me Barabbas. We're no better than them. I'm no better than them. All of us, were it not for the grace of God, deserve to die because of our sins. But we have the grace of God. Amen? Amen. And then comes the next, what I believe is one of the most powerful and convicting and heartbreaking scenarios in Jesus' vulnerability. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus says, If anyone desires to come after me and follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You're familiar with this text? It dawned on me a couple years ago, well, what did it look like when he took up his? In John 19 and verse 17, it says, And he, Jesus, bearing his own cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. And in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 32, it says, Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross. I have a very important question for you this morning. Does Scripture contradict itself, yes or no? These are not statements of contradiction. They're statements of chronology. Jesus began this journey carrying this weight, but something happens. See if we can make it through this. As Jesus passed the gate of Pilate's court, the cross which had been prepared for Barabbas was placed upon his bruised and bleeding shoulders. Two companions of Barabbas were to suffer death at the same time with Jesus, and upon them also crosses were placed. But the Savior's burden was too heavy for him in his weak and suffering condition. Since the Passover supper with his disciples, he had taken neither food nor drink. He had agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane in conflict with satanic agencies. He had endured the anguish of the betrayal and had seen his disciples forsake him and flee. He'd been taken to Annas, then to Caiaphas, then to Pilate. Then from Pilate he was sent to Herod, and then sent again to Pilate. From insult to renewed insult, from mockery to mockery, twice tortured by the scourge, all that night there had been scene after scene of a character to try the soul of man to the uttermost, but Christ had not failed. Amen? He had spoken no word but that tended to glorify God. All through the disgraceful farce of a trial, he had borne himself with firmness and dignity. But when after the second scourging, the cross was laid upon him, human nature could bear no more, and he fell fainting beneath the burden. The crowd that followed the Savior saw his weak and staggering steps, but they manifested no compassion. They taunted and reviled him because he could not carry the heavy cross. Again the burden was laid upon him, and again he fell fainting to the ground. His persecutors saw that it was impossible for him to carry his burden further. They're puzzled to find anyone who would bear this humiliating load. The Jews themselves could not do this because the defilement would prevent them from keeping the Passover. At least they have their priorities intact. None even of the mob that followed him would stoop to bear the cross. And this is where Simon steps in and we're told that actually leads to his conversion. But the question was, if Jesus is telling us to take up our cross and follow him, what's that going to look like? You're going to collapse. It's going to be too much and you're not going to be able to bear it. And that's the point, guys. 
Jesus humiliates himself by collapsing under the weight of the cross that he's been given to make it clear to you and to me that we're not losers when we're overwhelmed by the crosses that we're given. You're not a loser. Some of you are bearing burdens today that no one else knows about, and it's crushing you and it's killing you, and you're collapsing under the load. And Jesus wants you to know this morning that if you had to go through the agonizing and humiliating effort to carry the cross you've been given only to collapse under its weight, you have a Savior who understands. He's been there. We have to come face to face with the reality that we can't bear the cross that we've been given and that we need help from a source outside of us. And Jesus humiliates himself to give us this example. Vulnerability is not a sign of weakness. Then Jesus is nailed to this demonic torture device. He is raised into the air. They slam it into the ground and the hole in the rock that's prepared for it. And every nerve and sinew of his body has fire running through it. And yet we're told this strange line that the physical pain was quote-unquote hardly felt in comparison with the emotional and psychological agony that Jesus is enduring in this moment and the spiritual agony. Then words of unbelief are heaped at Jesus. If you're the Son of God, save yourself. The people who are crucified beside Jesus, if you're the Son of God, save yourself and us. And irony of ironies, it's precisely because Jesus is the Son of God that He's not coming down from that cross. And He's already saving them. They just haven't figured it out yet. Then this voice of sophistry returns, Jesus, these people don't appreciate you. You're wasting your time, man. Just move on. And Jesus ignores these temptations. And one of the hardest things for Jesus is that the only constant that he's had in his life for 33 and a half years is the presence and approval of his Father. And in this moment, it's gone. In the experiential mind of Jesus, it's as if the Father is not there. He can't sense Him. He can't feel Him. And words come out of the mouth of Jesus in this moment that you do not expect to hear from God Himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a direct quote from Psalm 22 and verse 1. And to the onlookers, it seems as though Jesus has lost faith. But if you're familiar with the rest of the chapter, there's a point of transition in verse 21 where it says, you have answered me. Verse 24 says that you have not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him, he heard. And then in verse 27, it says, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. This is going to lead to revival. That's the illusion here. So this is what Jesus said would happen in John chapter 12 and verse 32, that I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples unto me. But the darkness he's experiencing in these closing hours is eclipsing what he stated earlier, and Jesus had to choose to persevere through faith, even though he could not sense the Father's love. So Jesus didn't just remember Psalm 22 and verse 1 in case things got nasty, right, in case he ever got to a place where he doubted that God was with him, his whole life was filled with the reality of God's presence. But Jesus memorized the whole chapter, and this is so important for us, because when Jesus is claiming verse 1, he's also claiming the rest of the chapter. So when he's claiming verse 1 and it looks like defeat, he's claiming the whole chapter, which ends in victory. Amen? The faith of Jesus, persevering by faith, resting in the Father's love even when he can't feel it. You ever wonder why it is that it looks like midnight at noonday at the cross? We're told in Desire of Ages 753 that in that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. God Almighty is on earth in this moment. This is alluded to in Psalm 18, I believe. And He makes darkness His pavilion, conceals His glory from human eyes. God and His holy angels are beside the cross. The Father was with His Son, yet His presence was not revealed, and had His glory flashed forth from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. It's the mercy of God and the justice of God present at Calvary. 
Many of us would think these people deserve to get nuked by this encounter. They're crucifying Jesus, they're spitting in his face, they're gambling for his clothes, and yet in this moment, even these people are being spared and shown mercy so that they can respond to the faith of Jesus that they are not appreciating right now. The mercy and love of God on full display in this moment. Jesus is receiving what those people deserve, and they're receiving mercy so that they can respond. Their life is being justified in that moment while Jesus' life is being crucified. In that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the, Father, with the Father's presence. He trod the wine press alone, and of the people, there was none with them. You know why? Because there's times when you and I tread the wine press alone, and there's no one with us. Hebrews 4 tells us we have a high priest who's sympathetic to all of our weaknesses, all of our temptations. And he's sympathetic for this reason, so that when you're suffering and you're hurting in the same ways that he suffered and hurt, you'll come boldly into his presence, that you may receive grace and mercy to help you in your time of need. Tim Keller phrases it this way, that Jesus was truly abandoned so that we will only feel abandoned. Jesus had to endure a process that you and I will never have to endure because the comfort and presence of the Holy Spirit and Jesus are always available to us. This guy had to go through genuine radio silence, and he did it just for you and just for me. Jesus endured this so that you will not have to. But what is it that keeps Jesus going through all of this madness? Why is it that Jesus would keep going? What keeps him? Through all of this chaos, this madness, this awful, horrifying experience, you know what it was? It's you. Jesus cannot bear the thought of losing you. There's nothing more important to Him. We're told in another place that heaven was not a place to be desired while we were lost. Jesus does not want to be in heaven without a chance for you to be there, and He would rather risk everything. And it was a huge risk, because if Jesus stumbled in word, thought, or deed at any point on this journey, He will never see the Father again. He will never live again, and the universe itself may very well implode. That's a tremendous risk, my friends. But Jesus felt that you were worth taking that risk. Heaven was not a place to be desired while you and I were lost. And in this moment, as Jesus is being overwhelmed by the weight of the sin of the world and separation from His Father, He now is to a point in His own mind experientially where He is incapable of seeing through the portals of the tomb. Even though not all that long ago He had declared He would be raised in three days, at this stage, that's not an option anymore. Sin is so heinous in His sight by what He's experiencing that He will never see the Father again, He will never see the light of day again, and even if this plan of salvation does work and you're saved, He's not going to be there to see it. This is what Jesus is feeling in this moment, and this is why John chapter 13 and verse 1 is incredibly profound knowing that. It says that having loved, and it's the word agape here, perfect, other-centered, unselfish love, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus literally loved you to the end of his existence. If he will never see what happens as a result of this, if he's never raised, he loved you literally to the end of his experience. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. And in those dreadful hours, Jesus had relied upon the evidence of His Father's acceptance heretofore given Him. Remember, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12 says that here's the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, not their faith in Jesus, the faith of Jesus. There is coming a time, my friends, and some of us are going through many trials right now where it's difficult to persevere through faith in these trials. It's hard. Grief, loss, separation, abandonment, loneliness, betrayal. It's hard for us to cling to Jesus and to believe in the Father's love when all of life is coming against you. It's going to get worse, guys. And in that moment, our faith is not good enough. Our faith is not going to make it through these crises that we go with. Even the smaller ones in life, let alone the other things, we desperately need a faith that's greater than ours. And the good news is it's available to you this morning. The faith of Jesus. 
He can give you His faith. He can be the author and finisher of your faith and rewrite your faith story to have His success written in your place. He was acquainted with the character of His Father. He understood His justice, His mercy, and His great love. Even though it feels that God is nowhere to be found when I need you the most, I know you well enough to give you the benefit of the doubt and what I don't understand is happening right now when you're enduring the deafening silence of God. By faith, Jesus rested in Him whom it had ever been His joy to obey, and as in submission, He committed Himself to God, and the sense of His Father's favor was withdrawn, and by faith, Christ was victor. Amen? And then Jesus ascends into heaven. Some days later, Jesus ascends into heaven, and the angels erupt in praise. You have never seen a worship service like this in your life. And, as, and imagine, Jesus' love tank is pretty empty at this stage, yeah? Right? No one understands or appreciates Him on earth. You think He's ready for something. But in this moment, Jesus says, no! He refuses their worship, and He presses into the presence of the Father, and He has one question. Can those whom you have given me be with me where I am? Guys, nothing's more important to Jesus than you. You're all He thinks about. He refuses worship that He deserves just to be able to hear from the Father Himself. And the answer the Father gives is yes. Amen. Yes. And He embraces His Son for the first time in 33 and a half years. Yes, they can come. This is why Revelation 12 says that the heaven should rejoice but woe to the earth. Then I heard a voice a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. This is in response to the Christ event. For the accuser of the brethren who accused Him before our God day and night has been cast down and say hallelujah this morning. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. And this victory Jesus achieved even makes the angels and unfallen worlds more secure, we're told. In the Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, there's an article called, What Was Secured by the Death of Christ? So if you're wondering this morning if God can accept you, Calvary says, yes! Yes and amen. You are accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1 tells us. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. John 12.32 says, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all peoples unto myself. But that word peoples is supplied. It's bigger than that in a cosmic sense. When Jesus is lifted up, He literally draws awe to Himself. It's like a magnet of grace. Jesus, another moment of the faith of Jesus, it's evident here in His closing hours, is the fact that Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. But think about what's happening here. Jesus is praying to the Father who doesn't seem to be answering His previous prayers. And yet He still prays and by faith believes that when He prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, He knows the Father's love well enough to rest in the fact that He will do what He said. If that's not the faith of Jesus, guys, what is? Choosing to rest in the Father's love heretofore revealed. And uh, Desire of Ages says this about that prayer. That prayer of Christ for His enemies embraced who? The entire world. It took in every sinner that had lived or should live from the beginning of the world to the end of time. Upon all rests the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. And to all forgiveness is freely offered. Whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. And God's people at the end of time will also have this other-centered, unselfish love. Jesus, His faith, is worried about the thief on the cross. His faith is worried about His mother. His faith is worried about those who are lost. And the people at the end of time who truly receive the faith of Jesus will also have an outward faith that's worried and concerned about others and places others' needs above their own. And this is where... Uh, what was read by Patty earlier, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11 comes in, that Jesus shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You're justified by his faith and he's satisfied. Amen? 
And Jesus went through all this because He sees in you a pearl of great price. This is why Paul says in Romans 1, 16 to 17, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith, Jesus is overcoming and pursuing faith. To faith, our reciprocating faith in Him, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He's quoting from Habakkuk, and in the original language, Habakkuk says, the just shall live by His faith, by the faith of of Jesus. So Romans 14, verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The only way people can be viewed as having kept the commandments in the past or even being capable of keeping them in the present or the future is because of having first encountered the faith of Jesus. Only Jesus' sufferings, death, and righteous life can make one righteous. Listen to this. Many who profess to be Christians become excited over worldly enterprises, and their interest is awakened for new and exciting amusements, while they are cold-hearted and appear as if frozen in the cause of God. Here is a, th here is a theme, poor formalists, which is of sufficient importance to excite you. Eternal interests are here involved. Upon this theme, the cross of Christ, it is sin to be calm and unimpassioned. The scenes of Calvary call for the deepest emotions, and upon this subject, you will be excusable if you manifest enthusiasm. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Ellen White wrote this letter to a discouraged Christian. She said, the message from God to me for you is this, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. If you have nothing else to plead before God but this one promise from your Lord and Savior, you have the assurance that you will never never be turned away. It may seem that you're hanging upon a single promise, but appropriate that one promise and it will open to you the whole treasure house of the riches of the grace of Christ. Cling to that promise and you are safe. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. If you present this assurance to Jesus, she says, you are as safe as though inside of the city of God that if you have nothing to offer Jesus this morning, my life has been a mess, I can't get anything right, my promises are like ropes of sand. If you will press into His presence and say, you promised that if I come unto you, you're not going to cast me out. In that very moment, my friends, you are as safe as though inside of the city of God. So why wouldn't you come? Why would you refuse to come? The faith of Jesus. We're told it's talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message then? Jesus becoming our sin bearer that He might be our sin pardoning Savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated, and He came to our world and took our sins that we might take His righteousness. And faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply, fully, and entirely is us receiving the faith of Jesus. E.J. Wagner, one of the great gospel preachers of the late 1800s, phrases it this way, to show another element of the faith of Jesus. He says that God chooses men not for what they are, but for what He can make of them. And there's no limit to what He can make of even the meanest and most depraved if they're only willing and believe His Word. This also is a faith of Jesus, seeing something in you that you don't even see and treating you as if that were true. Why? To awaken within you a desire to live a life that would honor His faith in you. So the faith of Jesus that's received by God's people at the end of time is a faith that pierces through any darkness or doubt, rests in the Father's love, and one that sees the value in the people that have been purchased. We will see people for what God can make of them, not what they currently are. I want to close with an idea of what happens when we reject this message. Back to E.J. Wagner in Everlasting Covenant. He says, and so it was on throughout the plagues that all the steps in each case were not recorded, but we see that it was the long suffering and mercy of God that hardened Pharaoh's heart. The same preaching that comforted the hearts of many in the days of Jesus made others bitter against him. The raising of Lazarus from the dead fixed the determination of the hearts of the unbelieving Jews to kill him. And then listen to how he lands the plane. He says, the judgment will reveal the fact that everyone who has an hardness of heart rejected the Lord has done so in the face of the revelation of His mercy. If anyone is going to be lost in the end, they're going to have to step over the crucified body of Jesus to get there. Every single one of them is going to encounter a revelation of His grace. 
You want revival ASI? We're not going to find it until each one of us individually stares at the crucified body of Jesus and we realize that it's our fault. We did this. My sins killed Jesus. Mine. It should have been me up there. It should have been me. And yet Jesus saw something in you and in me that led Him to do this for us. He chose to step in my place to take what I deserve and to make a way of salvation for me, and He's offering that to you as well this morning. Maybe you've lost your first love. Maybe you've lost sight of what this whole thing is really about. Jesus is inviting you today to come back to your first love, to open the door of your heart like the invitation He gave to the church at Laodicea, to let Him in and to dine with Him. Maybe you've never given yourself to Him. There's no better time to do that than today. So as Sarah and Neville share this song, I want to invite you to give Him your heart, to let Him do a transforming work in your life, to earnestly pray as you're hearing this song, to have an open heart and, a hope in my, and an open mind. God, I want all of you, and I want you to have all of me. I've lost my first love. I'm just in the, in the, the, the habits of life, doing the thing I've always been doing, but I dropped you somewhere along the way, and I need that again. I miss that closeness that we used to have. I miss that experience we used to have together. And if you've never had that experience, there is no better day to make that decision than today. Amen? So as you hear this song, I want you to pray with your heart and with your mind and give God permission to do something wonderful for you. Let's pray. God, I pray that the Spirit of Jesus would speak to each heart present and remind us of just how much you see in us, how much you value us, the price you paid to redeem us. And oh God, I pray that we would appreciate it and that as a result of the faith of Jesus, today we would place our faith in Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath and praise be to God. The total for the offering that God has given us today is $2,005,755. Amen. Amen. We have been blessed this week. We have drunk from a fire hose this week of incredible messages from the Lord. Typically when the offering is announced, Debbie, we sing praise God from whom all blessings flow, a very appropriate response. However, this year, we're going to try something different. You're going to stand to your feet, and we're going to sing Take My Life and Let It Be as a hymn of consecration. I want you to raise this roof. Then when we get to the verse, take my silver and my gold, whatever is left within you, praise the Lord with those words. So let's sing. Naomi is going to lead you. Don't want to hear me sing. But Naomi will lead us in an amazing, vibrant version of Take My Life and Let It Be. We're going to sing all the stanzas. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the messages that we've had from thee. I thank you, Lord, for ears to hear. Lord, may our hearts respond in kind to what you've responded and given to us. I pray, Lord, that we will not go away from here the same, but we will be transformed you emptied all heaven for us. Lord, may we be grateful. I pray for each person here that we will go out and be witnesses for you of what you've done for us. May we hold nothing back from you who have given so much. Thank you again, Lord, for the messages. Thank you that we have opened our hearts with our silver and our gold. 
Lord, may we not withhold from your might of anything. I thank you for hearing this prayer. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, my dear Savior and our dear Savior, amen.